Thank you, Jose Pablo. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you for uh, having us. I am uh, Jean-Louis Repetto. I am the commercial manager for Empa Simon, and I uh, live and work in uh, France. I'm going to take you through the first steps of this uh, presentation, and then uh, Rena will uh, take over. Um, so first, the physics of dynamic line rating. How does it work? Um, dynamic line rating is about uh, operating an overhead line as close as possible to the thermal limits without uh, compromising safety and, of course, without uh, damaging uh, your equipment. Mm, so to um, consider the thermal limits, you have um, to consider two things. First, the, the maximum conductor temperature itself. Uh, it's a given feature of, of, the, of the cable given by the cable manufacturer and uh, confirmed by the, uh, the line uh, designers they will uh, state you have a maximum operation temperature that is uh, maybe uh, 70 degrees, 72 degrees, 75, 80 degrees and uh, the dispatch engineers must not uh, cross this limit. Um, secondly, you have um, to uh, follow the uh, minimum clearance uh, rules also um, designed by the uh, line uh, designers. Um, <clears throat> so um, they will say you have a minimum clearance in all the, the spans of your line, and it amounts to uh, not crossing a maximum SAG limit that is also part of the, of the design. Mm. So if you operate uh, your line uh, the classic way, you will take care of these two uh, limitations, and uh, you will operate with uh, static ratings. Um, in France, for example, we have uh, seasonal ratings. They are uh, fixed, but seasonal. We have uh, winter, summer, and uh, interseason. These ratings are based on the uh, worst possible uh, environmental uh, conditions, that is, you take into account uh, the fact that there will be no wind, that the ambient temperature will be uh, maximum uh, possible, and uh, there will be no cloud at uh, 12 noon. So these are the, the worst possible uh, conditions that define your uh, static seasonal uh, ratings. Of course, you know that these conditions are just for safety and that most of the time, there are better than that. You have a little wind or uh, some clouds or the temperature has dropped uh, a little. Um, so all the, the, uh, the principles of dynamic line ratings are based on uh, knowing uh, conditions and using the available margins safely. Uh, to do that, uh, you have to monitor the line, uh, its condition in real time. Um, so if you know SAG that you see on this uh, diagram above, uh, if you know SAG in real time, uh, you will uh, know the, uh, the margin that uh, you have before you, you reach maximum SAG in uh, meters. And you can uh, convert this uh, margin into uh, amperes and know uh, what is the, the gains that you have that are available before you reach your safety limits. Mm. I'd like to say that it's, uh, it's very simple and uh, it's quite uh, nice and uh, thank you for listening, but uh, it's not so simple. Uh, in fact, if you see here on the right uh, on this uh, drawing, uh, it's, uh, it's a Sigre uh, drawing, and you see that the, the conductor um, uh, is in, the, uh, is in a thermal equilibrium uh, affected by uh, solar radiation, obviously, ambient temperature, the line's uh, load, uh, conductor going, going through the load going through the, the conductor, and cooling by, uh, by wind. And since we are not in a lab, uh, this uh, thermal equilibrium is always uh, changing. So you have to take into account the, the uh, changing uh, parameters if you want to do uh, dynamic line ratings. Mm, in more details, uh, I said you have uh, thermal uh, irradiation, so it's, it's always there, uh, during the day at least, 
and it will affect uh, the ratings, but not very uh, massively, not very significantly. Uh, as well as ambient temperature, it changes, it goes up and down, uh, and it will also affect the ratings. Uh, this is why we have in some countries uh, winter ratings and summer ratings. Um, so the, all this is, is true. Um, nevertheless, the most important uh, parameter is wind because this is the massive cooling effect that will give you uh, more or less uh, gains. Uh, if you look at the, the diagram uh, to the left, it's an IEEE uh, chart. Uh, so these are the official uh, charts for a certain type of conductor. It's not important. What's, what's important is the shape of the curves. And uh, as you can see, uh, at the left, you have the reference curve showing uh, for which load uh, the uh, maximum conductor temperature is reached. So on this uh, diagram, we see that around 1,000 amps maximum conductor uh, temperature, which here is set at, uh, at 75 degrees. Is, is reached. Now, uh, this is for um, the design of the lines when, when there is no wind or uh, in Europe uh, 0.5 meters per second. Now, if you have two meters per second, you can see that the, the gains are uh, dramatically uh, impressive uh, because the capacity of the same uh, conductor has doubled only with two meters per second of wind. With, with, uh, sorry, it has increased by 50%. Uh, I'm going too fast. Now, with five meters per uh, second, uh, in that case, the, the capacity of the conductor has uh, doubled without any uh, um, uh, further uh, action of, uh, uh, of any sort. Uh, so this is uh, attractive enough to uh, think about uh, developing methods to do uh, dynamic line rating. Um, so as I said, it's, it is not uh, very simple because uh, to find the answer, what is my uh, margin? Uh, this answer cannot be found by solving uh, one simple uh, equation. Uh, that's why uh, international bodies like uh, IEEE and uh, CIGRE have uh, designed uh, standards uh, that are applicable if you want to engage in uh, dynamic line rating. Um, so there are uh, different types of, of standards. The most uh, important to uh, remember, if you want one, is the IEEE 738 uh, here on the left, uh, which is uh, what we call the thermal model. Uh, there is also a Seagray uh, thermal model. Uh, they are uh, relatively similar. Uh, anyway, if you have all your uh, the data uh, available, you need to uh, run them through this uh, thermal model uh, to get uh, usable uh, information to uh, perform dynamic line rating. So for those who are interested here, we have listed all these uh, standards. And uh, the CIGRE ones are, uh, can be downloaded for free on the CIGRE uh, website. And the IEEE is, uh, you need a subscription, you need to pay. If we summarize, uh, so uh, to do dynamic line rating, you have uh, at the center, the uh, thermal model, and you have to uh, feed this uh, model with uh, parameters like uh, clearance or sag in, uh, in real time. That is uh, paramount to uh, conductor temperature, of course. Sag is the ultimate consequence of uh, thermal of the conductor temperature at a certain uh, moment. You need your uh, design uh, properties uh, to be able to know uh, where your limits are to make uh, calculations on the gains, on the available gains. You will need the, the lines uh, load uh, to uh, compute the gains and also for uh, other, other applications like uh, transient uh, ratings. And you need the uh, weather parameters, uh, that is uh, wind speed, ambient temperature, and solar radiation. So all these are uh, crunched into the thermal model, and the output will be uh, opacity ratings, dynamic ratings, uh, real-time ratings, maybe uh, forecasts, forecasts if you want to do that. Um, that's the, uh, 
theoretical approach. In fact, there are uh, two uh, basic ways to, to do that. Uh, the one we, we favor at Ampassimon is based on the sensor. So you will have with a sensor mounted on the line uh, measurements of uh, effective wind, sag, current, conductor, conductor temperature is uh, derived of, uh, from the, the sag, with the, the state equation of the conductor. And in addition to these uh, field measured parameters, you need ambient temperature and solar radiations. These are uh, relatively easy to collect, especially uh, nowadays in the 21st century. They are uh, weather web services. So it's, uh, it's uh, simple to uh, subscribe to a web service uh, provider and get the information with granularity that is uh, needed to perform the, the computations. So again, with the thermal model and some uh, computing power, you uh, get your ratings. The other method that has been also developed for a couple of years, a number of years rather, is based purely on uh, modeling. All the, the parameters, uh, temperature, wind speed, and solar radiation, are uh, collected from uh, also uh, weather services and uh, computed uh, to uh, perform uh, thermal modeling. As you may have understood, we do not uh, favor this approach. Uh, comparing uh, the available method uh, from left to right, so you have uh, the, the sensor-based uh, method with line-mounted uh, sensors measure, measuring uh, SAG. Uh, this is uh, our method. Uh, the nice thing about it is that the third-party inputs that you see at the bottom of the box are only ambient temperature, solar radiation, and possibly line current, uh, because the same sensor also measures uh, the effective wind, affecting the, the conductor. Uh, another method is a line-mounted currents uh, sensor. So instead of measuring a SAG, you measure currents. Um, so it's, uh, it's another method. Uh, and uh, as compared with the first one, you also need to collect uh, the effective wind from a third-party uh, input. Uh, third uh, method with uh, temperature uh, conductor, conductor temperature uh, sensor uh, mounted somewhere on the conductor. We do not uh, favor this approach because uh, conductor temperature is, uh, is very difficult to, uh, to measure. It can change along the line, even uh, along the same span, if there are some obstacles uh, blocking wind. And uh, the probe itself, being in a box, will uh, act as a, as a radiator, a heat sink. And uh, the sensor itself, the probe, will affect uh, measurements. So we do not favor this uh, approach. And uh, lastly, the um, model-based, weather model-based approach with no, uh, no sensors at all on the, on the line, on the conductor, only weather stations uh, and weather modeling. In terms of the features, we have drawn this uh, table to, to compare these uh, four uh, approaches. Um, this is based on experience. The, the first question that we have from our customers is our um, do we need a, a survey uh, to, to know how to install the, the sensors? So is it, uh, does it take some uh, preparation work to do that? Is it easy to, uh, to install? Is it long? Do we need a, an outage, a shutdown? Other? Do, um, is it complex? Do we need to train people to do the installation? Do we need to uh, calibrate the sensors? Um, what about the power supply? So all the, the practical implementation uh, aspects are uh, important features that you have to, to consider if and when you start the dynamic line rating uh, program. Uh, after that, uh, you have to be uh, conscious of, of what you can get in terms of uh, measurements, uh, data, field data. Uh, again, I repeat, the most important after uh, the line condition itself SAG occurrence is the, the wind speed. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, to have good quality uh, outputs, um, 
you need a certain amount of uh, processing power, and of course you need to be able to uh, to check your uh, measurements, your results against uh, maybe uh, field checks or uh, comparisons. So this table is a bit uh, complex to read, but uh, as uh, Fernando said, the presentation and the recordings will be available after the after the webinar. Um, now, uh, does DLR apply uh, to all uh, situations everywhere? Uh, almost. Um, firstly, the dynamic line rating is for overhead lines, uh, obviously, but uh, you may want to uh, perform the same, uh, to have the same approach to underground uh, circuits uh, or the underground part of a hybrid uh, circuit. So there are methods to do um, thermal rating for uh, underground cables. Obviously, uh, it's not based on the same uh, sensors or on the same uh, measuring uh, method. Um, however, there are uh, standards and algorithms that uh, are used to perform the computations. Uh, of course, the, the gains that you can get underground are not as uh, spectacular as the ones you can get uh, with overhead lines because there is no wind to cool down the lines and the changes in the, in the uh, soil are not so, uh, so fast as, as uh, in the air. But gains are, are possible and it's always good to monitor uh, your circuits uh, if only for safety. Um, after the, the circuit, the, uh, the overhead line and underground circuit, there are uh, transformers. So there are also dynamic ratings for uh, transformers. It's not uh, today's uh, subject. Um, so if we go back to overhead lines, uh, in terms of voltage levels, uh, DLR applications can be done uh, from uh, 20 kV to 800 kV. We have all sorts of uh, cases. Um, the, uh, the sensors can be installed uh, with or without uh, shutdown. It's important for uh, EHV uh, voltage levels, uh, 800, 400 kV, 380, 320 kV. We have cases, uh, especially in Europe, where installation is done uh, live. Um, DC circuits uh, have not seen any dynamic line rating so far because uh, the sensors are powered by induction. And uh, these, um, uh, these, uh, these lines, uh, DC circuits, are only for uh, EHV. So installation, live installation is, is quite uh, expensive, and so would be uh, de-installation to change the batteries or uh, well, to do some, some actions on the sensor. So um, for the moment, there is no DLR on uh, DC lines. Um, you can do a DLR with uh, HTLS, high temperature, um, low sag uh, conductors, if only to check that the sag is really as low as the manufacturer will we say. Um, alloy type is, is not important. Uh, we have uh, cases with uh, a, triple AC, AC, SR, uh, even uh, copper, it can happen. Uh, it's, only a, it's only a parameter, just like a conductor diameter. The fact that uh, the, the circuit is with uh, dual uh, conductors or triple, uh, quad, uh, whatever. Um, then uh, results can be a bit uh, disappointing if, if, the, if the conductor temperature ratings are uh, low. Uh, so if, if you want to operate your line here, uh, we put 40 degrees at a maximum 40, 45, 50 degrees. Of course, this temperature will be reached uh, very quick. Uh, on a hot day, uh, even without load, it can be reached. So don't expect uh, exciting results if you, if you want to do dynamic line rating with, with very low um, uh, maximum conductor temperature. Now that can, be, uh, that can be discussed sometimes. We have seen that some utilities are a bit too uh, conservative about that, but uh, it's their choice. Um, in terms of uh, accessories like uh, spacers or uh, dampers, um, the DLR is not affected by uh, these accessories, uh, and it does not affect uh, them uh, as well. The, the sensors are put uh, a bit away from uh, spacers or dampers, and uh, let's say there is no uh, interaction between, between them. 
uh, finally, uh, all sorts of uh, circuits can be uh, equipped. Uh, Rena will uh, explain you a few uh, application examples. Uh, as for us, we have seen uh, conduct uh, circuits from yeah, from two to one hundred uh, kilometers. Some in the plain, some in the mountains, some with uh, with in straight lines, some with uh, many turns. So it really depends, and uh, every case is uh, different. Uh, Rena now will uh, take over and uh, give you a few examples of uh, application cases, real cases. Okay, thank you very much, John Louis. My name is Rene Kuwahata. I'm the Business Development Manager at Ampassimo. I'd like to continue the training session now to the second module on application examples of implementation by grid operators. Grid operators exist in various forms of company structures around the world. In Europe, there are transmission and distribution system operators who own, maintain, and operate the grid assets like power lines and substations. They also have the, man, have the mandate to ensure that there is sufficient generation to meet demand at all times, even if they may not actually own the generation or retail businesses themselves. The core mandate of a system or a grid operator is to ensure the security of the grid at all times, so there are no damage to the grid assets, and to design and secure sufficient grid capacity for reliability so that the cause of a power outage to customers is not caused by insufficient capacity to transport energy from the power plant to the con consumers. And also to aim for a lean design and maximum utilization that results in delivery of affordable electricity supply. This means to make sure there is sufficient grid capacity to access cheaper sources of energy. These are universal mandates for all grid operators. For specific regions, there may be additional mandates like ensuring transition to carbon-free energy sources. To achieve these core mandates, the grid operator has an intricate chain of activities which are carried out on a rolling basis. This is what I show here. It starts from long-term planning, years or even decades ahead, based on future scenario projections to decide which power lines and substations need to be upgraded, replaced, or new ones created. Once the assets are built, they need to be maintained in tip-top condition so that they are available when they're needed. Therefore, the next activity is asset management and maintenance planning, which starts years to months ahead. Then to make sure we have enough grid capacity tomorrow to deliver the expected amount of energy, the grid, plan, uh, grid operation planning process starts a week to a few days ahead. In these days, before real time, power flow calculations are performed using grid models that reflect what is expected to actually be the status on that day in terms of the grid, including scheduled maintenance outages, renewables in feed based on weather forecasts, power plant production schedules, expected power consumption, and cross-border trade. If the power flow simulation indicates that an overload of a power line is expected as a result, the grid operators take action to remedy the situation. Finally, if the grid operators did their job right, we will continue to have a good quality electricity supply for our daily conveniences. If the grid operator has developed such an intricate plan over decades, perfected the art of how to deliver reliable good quality supply, why would they need dynamic line rating? The answer is that there are major changes taking place decarbonization of the power supply, decentralization of power supply and proliferation of electric transportation, digitization of power systems monitoring and control, regulatory changes like unbundling and incentive regimes, and climate change causing necessity to rethink scenarios, forecasts, risk management, resiliency and robustness of systems, and also the power flow management methods. What is the value that dynamic line rating provides in facing these challenges? It's quite simple if you think of it in terms of the value of having more grid capacity and having more visibility or situational awareness through monitoring. The value of extra grid capacity is well known. You can avoid or delay grid reinforcements that may be necessary to integrate renewables. You can cater for peak loads, for example, caused by electric vehicle charging, ease grid congestions and avoid having to use expensive or disrupt rem disruptive remedy actions, which I will explain more later. You can increase trade capacity with neighbors with cheaper power prices. This means you can also sell more to your neighbor. Facilitating broader access to cheaper energy means generating social welfare. The main benefit of having more visibility and situational awareness through monitoring with DLR systems is that you can evaluate better your asset performance and risks, which can be applied in asset management. 
going to skip a little bit, come back to this later. The main value of dynamic line rating to grid operators is related to congestion management. It gives flexibility to avoid otherwise cumbersome and costly remedial actions. In Europe, a number of congestion management actions are recommended by the Association of Transmission System Operators, called ENSO-E. That's what you see here. Some of them are considered cost-free, like modification of grid topology and reactive power control, while some of the others may incur costs, like redispatch and renewable curtailment. By having additional grid capacity enabled through dynamic line rating, we can avoid a lot of these actions by just having accurate information at the right time. For this, forecast dynamic line rating plays a cr critical role. Dynamic line rating systems without accurate forecasts do not provide as much value as those with good forecast algorithms. For example, one hour ahead of real time, the state estimator in the grid control center automatically calculates the N-1 security power flows to assess on a rolling basis the expected loading on the line. For this calculation, one hour dynamic line rating forecast values from our systems are automatically streamed into the calculation module. In a similar way, four hour ahead, a day ahead dynamic line rating forecast values are used for grid security calculations instead of static ratings. By using the DLR values directly in the N-1 security calculations, the expected congestion or overload risks are automatically reduced. Automating this process means that it reduces human errors of handling the data. It also reduces the need to even consider cumbersome topology actions and costly remedial actions. All of this must be in a good quality, though, so that it guarantees no violation of safety limits like minimum clearance and conductor temperature. Now, I'm going to describe an example of how dynamic line rating is actually used by a transmission system operator. This is typically how you would see the output in a control room. This is a screenshot of a monitor in the National Grid Control Center in Belgium. The example shown here is a result of what happened after a market close on 13th of September 2017. The blue line is the static seasonal rating, while the red curve is the dynamic line rating coming from the Ampassimon sensors. The green curve shows the power flow on a major 380 kV line in Belgium. So, on the 13th of September, the grid operation center was facing a challenging output for the next day. Energy exchange between Germany and France, which inevitably flows through Belgium, was settled on the day ahead market, so they were expecting high north to south flows on the backbone transmission network, especially in the evening peak hours when demand picks up, and when Germany had plenty of wind energy to export. However, one of the backbone transmission lines was out of service due to maintenance work. It was being upgraded to a line with high capacity, so it couldn't be brought back into service at short notice. At this stage, this meant that during those peak hours, it was highly likely that the resulting power flows would be too high to ensure an N minus one security of the grid. Therefore, the operators in the grid control center prepared to change the transformer tapping at the phase shifting transformers positioned at the borders of Belgium with Netherlands to redirect the power flow away from the congested areas. The maximum tap setting for the PST is 18, but for day ahead operations, typically it is limited to maximum of six and this is to leave room for emergency situations in the intraday. So that means the PSP tapping was prepared to be at its maximum possible setting for the day ahead. However, they realized that this would not be enough to get rid of the potential M-1 security violation. Therefore, they decided to make some topological arrangements in the 150 kV subtransmission grid, also to try to redirect away some of the power flows. Even with all the effort by the grid operator to solve the congestion using his own assets, it would not get rid of the potential N-1 security threat. So at this point, they prepared to instruct some power plants to redispatch. This means instructing power plants in France to divert from the production schedule and increase the output, while at the same time instructing power plants in the Netherlands to decrease the output. Belgium is limited in terms of power plants in the own territory, especially to counter the expected diagnosis of cell power flows. Um, this quite some noise. Somebody might need to mute themselves. Uh, so they were prepared for the, the 14th of September and then the clock ticked over to the next day. As the intraday activity started on the 14th of September, updates to the forecast consumption to the power plant production schedule considered. Also, Considering also the intraday trading results started to roll in. 
earlier than swiftly updated the expected power flow calculations for the critical evening peak. And uh, the result was still quite tight, but manageable. The topological measures set in place the day before, stayed as it was, but the phase shifting transformers didn't have to be tapped as high as anticipated. The tapping was set to four instead of six. The resulting power flow is shown in the figure as the green curve. This is the actual line loading on the 380 kV transmission line. You can see the green curve becomes very close to the static rating, blue curve, in the critical evening peak hours. If the N-1 security calculations had been based on static ratings, this flow for sure would have resulted in security violation, causing the need to tap the PST for six or even higher, and definitely to activate the redispatch instruction of the foreign power plant. However, since Elia knew with sufficient confidence that in fact, in reality, there would be sufficient line capacity to buy reliable DLR, the grid would be N-1 safe without any action. This is because Elia is confident in the fact that dynamic line rating is a reliable limit to replace the static rating in N-1 security calculations. Therefore, for this particular case described for the 14th of September, dynamic line rating was able to save Elia expensive redispatching actions and also the need to tap further the PSTs. The next two slides I'll go through quickly because of time constraints, but please feel free to ask questions on them at the end of this webinar and even afterwards by email. So, if there are so many obvious benefits to dynamic line rating, why is it not more widely used? Actually, many grid operators already apply some form of flexible rating of their power lines and substations. It might be that they use uh, um, ratings that vary between seasons, like winter rating and summer rating, like jean louis explained before, or by ambient temperature, what is called an ambient adjusted rating. But these methods still underestimate a lot of the additional capacity that actually exists. What is the bottleneck then to deploy real dynamic line rating systems, like the ones supplied by Anfasimon? Based on our more than 10 years of experience, we can say, that the major hurdles to adoption of these systems are not about the maturity of the technology or the reliability of the sensor system. It's more about the way the incentives are set up for grid operators to really become active about driving down operational expenditure. So this can be in the form of a regulatory bottleneck, slow pace of coordinated decision making, and the methods used by and options available to grid operators to avoid potential overloads. If you manage to overcome the hurdles that I mentioned, then dynamic line rating can deliver significant benefits in the form of additional grid capacity and enhanced visibility. With enhanced visibility, you can monitor better the asset risks like temperature and sag of a power line. Forecast values for these parameters can also be provided together with the forecast dynamic line rating. And if you use unpassable sensors that measure vibration, you can also detect physical anomalies like tower fall, galloping of the line, and icing on the line. With enhanced visibility, maintenance outages can be better managed by handling the power flows that need to be rerouted. This was done, for example, by the Dutch TSO. As an advanced user of dynamic line rating systems, you can start using data science and combining it with big data, artificial intelligence, etc., to make your existing processes and methods smarter and trigger automated responses. For example, the Belgian TSO has begun to adapt its power line maintenance strategy to consider more accurate line loading statistics and its impact on aging to inform its replacement plans. Also, we are in discussions with some utilities about linking the dynamic line rating to automated relay activations to enable active network management. Now I'm going to hand the ball back to uh, Jean-Louis quickly for the next two slides. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, Yes, this is uh, a screen capture of uh, ELIA's um, National uh, Control Center uh, energy management uh, tool. Uh, so we can see on this uh, screenshot, uh, firstly, very kindly, they put our name at the uh, top left of the, of the screen. Uh, so our name is there because uh, they use our uh, data that our uh, mapped into uh, their uh, EMS SCADA. Uh, the, to summarize this quickly, the, the, the Ampacity server is seen as an RTU by the, the front end, front end uh, the front end computers of the SCADA system. 
and uh, we provide uh, standard frames. Uh, here it's uh, ICCP frames, but it could be uh, IC104 or uh, the MP3, uh, IC101, or whatever, as long as they follow an international standard. And so the, these frames contain the, the data that are uh, computed or measured by uh, our sensors and our algorithms. Um, so you see uh, the, the uh, transmission lines of uh, ALIA are shown here uh, by voltage levels. It's not very clear, but you see uh, on the top left 150 kV and then uh, uh, below 70 kV. And uh, on the right, um, 380 kV and 220 kV. So the, these lines are here in blue. It's the line identifiers. And uh, the, um, the load is, is shown next to the line identifier in uh, MVA. So you have 22.8 MVA, 10.6 MVA, uh, et cetera. And the, uh, the seasonal, the seasonal uh, limit is also uh, shown next to it, next to it in, in MVA and um, framed in uh, yellow, you have the, the dynamic line rating uh, limit as it is uh, computed by our system with, it's not the real time rating that you see here, it's the one hour uh, forecast capped. So let me explain, the, 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 when you do dynamic line rating, you have uh, the, the real time rating that uh, gives you the, uh, the load that you can put through your circuit uh, immediately uh, at, at the same uh, minutes or where you are uh, reading the screen. It's the available uh, capacity of the line at this uh, minute. Then uh, with some more uh, computations and algorithms, you can perform some forecasts. So we have forecasts to uh, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, uh, six hours, or a uh, day ahead with uh, 24, 48 hours or more. Now here we have the one hour uh, forecast and you can see that it is capped because uh, ALIA decided to, to cap all gains at uh, 30%. That is even if there are more capacity available, ALIA will not consider uh, capacity gains above, above 30%, uh, which is uh, good enough if you ask me for a transmission line, if you, if you convert uh, these uh, MVAs into uh, uh, billable uh, power, it's a huge amount. Anyway, uh, you can see uh, these, these uh, available uh, ratings uh, for the next hour uh, to, the, to the right. And as Rena said, uh, these numbers uh, can be used for the uh, power flow simulation and the uh, computations of uh, scenarios for uh, N minus 1 or N minus 2 uh, contingencies. Um, what else? Um, well, there are other screens that could have been uh, captured with the real-time rating, with the day ahead, uh, day ahead uh, forecast. Uh, what is important to uh, stress now is that, uh, of course, the, the, the ultimate uh, destination of a DLR solution is to be used uh, in real time uh, with forecast or not, but. Uh, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis in, in the um, work routine of the uh, dispatch engineers in the control rooms. So uh, firstly, they have to be uh, confident in the, uh, the ratings that uh, you give them. And uh, secondly, in terms of uh, integration, uh, the solution has to be uh, uh, integrated. That is, the, the uh, data have to be uh, mapped into the uh, SCADA system, uh, whatever it is. Um, and uh, you can apply uh, different options with uh, redundancy, with uh, backups, uh, historical uh, data analysis, uh, statistics. You can do a lot of things with the, with the data. But firstly, the dispatch engineers have to uh, trust the solutions. We have found in uh, 10 years and more of uh, existence that uh, as long as the dispatch engineers don't uh, trust you, uh, you're not going anywhere. Uh, I have a next slide, I think, with uh, animation. Uh, Fernando. Mm. Yes, so uh, here um, we created an animation with, uh, with real uh, data that are from a, a real case. So I'm not going to uh, disclose uh, which case, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's based on, on real data that we have 
that we are uh, we play uh, with this uh, animation. Um, so at, at the, the bottom, the light blue curve is the ambient uh, adjusted rating, what we call the ambient adjusted rating. So you can clearly see it's based on, on temperature, basically. Uh, so clearly, uh, you can see the uh, 12 noon uh, peaks. Uh, so when uh, the uh, temperature is uh, maximum and uh, the, the, uh, the sky may be blue with uh, maximum solar radiation. And uh, the, uh, the pink and, and blue curves, are the, the blue curve is the, uh, the dynamic line rating that uh, our system uh, provided. And uh, the pink uh, band is the forecast that we uh, computed with, with our system. So uh, if, I, if I stop the, the animation here, you see uh, so the, uh, the light blue uh, curve uh, is, uh, let's say, a, a reference. Uh, normally, uh, the ratings cannot be uh, below that. Um, and the, uh, the pink band is one, one hour, uh, or, well, it's more than one hour. Maybe it's, yeah, it's uh, 24 hours uh, ahead, sorry. And uh, John, so you, you can, yes? Yeah, you can use this pointer. Um, uh, if you want to explain. Ah, thank you. Better. Yes, yes, okay, perfect, I have it. Uh, so here is the, the band that, that uh, show you the, the ratings uh, available 24 hours uh, ahead. And uh, you can see that this band has some uh, breadth. Uh, and so we, we, we say it's the, it derives from the confidence index that is uh, required by the, um, by the, um, the TSO or the DSO. Uh, of course, uh, all this is, is done on, uh, on modeling and forecasts, uh, and so you can uh, request uh, a very uh, aggressive confidence index, that is, you want to be sure at 99.9% uh, .9 that the forecast is good, and uh, in that case, uh, it will be a little more conservative, and the band will be uh, wider. So uh, here, I don't know, maybe the, the confidence index was uh, 95 or 98 uh, percent. Uh, and uh, what is important to see is that the, the rating that we uh, give, that we provide, is within this uh, band, and it has the same uh, profile as the, as the band uh, itself. Uh, so it's, it's a good sign uh, as to its uh, effectiveness. And it stays inside uh, the band uh, to uh, to follow the, the requirements of the of the customer. So, in in short, it's a forecast that you can use. Uh, so you see here, we had a slight uh, <laughs> uh, way uh, way wild way. Uh, so that's 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 the risk uh, uh, that you that you take if you choose a confidence index that is uh, above ninety percent. Uh, you have some some risk. Um, what else? Um, our method is is based on uh, bilinear uh, regression, uh, so it's uh, it's a bit like the linear regression that we did uh, at school, but uh, more complex, of course. And uh, it's effective to do what we want to do because uh, it it shows uh, not a maximum value but uh, a band of, of uh, likely uh, uh, results. And then, again, uh, based on the confidence uh, index that you uh, agree to, uh, to have, um, the, the, the forecast will stay uh, inside that band. So you, you can use it. You can use it for various uh, applications. It can be for day-to-day -day operation. Or it can be for, uh, in, in this case, if we have a day-ahead uh, forecast, it's uh, more applicable to uh, energy market uh, operations and uh, day ahead uh, capacity forecast, uh, things like this. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's clear enough. Uh, Rena, if you want uh, to continue. Yes. yes, only thing to add here, just to make sure everybody is on the same page, that the vertical axis, which is perpendicular wind speed, that's actually in the video wrong. That's obviously oh, yes. uh, should be mm. the line rating in amps. And also mm. the, the forecasting method, right, the linear regression that you mentioned is for the short-term uh, forecast. The day ahead forecast and, and the two day ahead forecast also takes into consideration uh, weather forecast information. And okay. has, a learning, has a learning algorithm. Okay. Uh, improve over time. So 
Okay, very good, thank you. And I continue to the slide again. How do we go back? Okay. So now I'd like to continue to the third part of the training session. We described already the benefits of dynamic loan rating to a grid operator or owner in general terms, but I'd like to give some concrete examples from actual projects. Um, we're a bit pressed for time, so I'm going to only explain in detail two of the four examples in this webinar today. But please feel free to ask any questions at the end of this webinar and even afterwards by email. I will be happy to explain further on the other examples as well. The first example is the benefit of increasing cross-border trade. In Belgium, all cross-border lines to its neighbors, namely Netherlands, France, and Luxembourg, are equipped with dynamic line rating systems. Also, most of the internal 380 kV grid is monitored with our system. On the 19th of February 2015, the two-day ahead forecast showed that the demand would be high due to typical winter temperatures around zero degrees Celsius, and also the local supply was tight because of nuclear power plant outages. This meant that there was a high reliance on importing neighbors' cheaper supply. The two-day ahead dynamic line rating forecast showed, so on the 17th of February, that the weather conditions would be cooling the critical transmission lines. This meant that 3% capacity increase could be relied upon the critical bottleneck lines inside of Belgium. This resulted in that the cross-border import capacity could be increased as well, so that 22% more energy could be imported during four hours compared to the case where the import capacity is calculated based on static ratings. This meant that Belgium was able to import cheaper energy in critical high price periods and were able to save close to 250,000 euros in supplying energy to its local citizens. So that's the first one. Unfortunately, I have to skip the example on wind integration due to lack of time. But wind integration is the obvious use case for dynamic line rating because when there is wind, there is cooling, and therefore there is capacity. For example, we are in a framework agreement with RTE France to deploy dynamic line rating systems uh, at the moment, and this is mainly for wind integration. But for today, I unfortunately have to skip this. And we go to the third example, which is from Germany, where there are vast amounts of congestion on a daily basis. This is known to be mainly caused by increasing wind power installations in the north of the country, which needs to be delivered to the demand centers in the south of the country. This is compounded by the exiting nu nuclear and coal power plants, which are in the south, and uh, they're being fa phased out at the moment. The German regulatory authority publishes annual statistics in which it reports the top congested lines in terms of numbers of hours congested, amounts of energy that needed to be redispatched because of the congestion, and the resulting costs, etc. For example, in 2017 and 2018, the annual cost of congestion management exceeded 1 billion euros each year. Using simple division, this is about 100,000 euros per hour or 4 million euros per day which is costing German electricity consumers. Even if you look at only the redispatch component of the congestion management cost, I explained earlier that congestion management may include redispatch, counter trading, demand response, renewable curtailment, etc. So even if you look at only the redispatch component, the cost is 23,000 euros per gigawatt hour. And we look at one example, this uh, line bill Ost in West Germany, which is listed as one of the culprits for high congestions in the 2017 report by the regulator. On this line, we have our DLR system installed for two years. The summary of the performance is shown in this slide. This is uh, typically how you would assess line performance with, uh, of DLR. Here you see the duration curves of the dynamic line rating of the 380 kV line. Each curve is a summary of the five minutely data results over the two year period. On the vertical axis is the capacity gain given by the dynamic line rating as a percentage of the seasonal rating. On the horizontal axis is the percentage of time over the two years to the dynamic line rating was at a certain value. This means that if you look at 50% on the horizontal axis, it gives the average dynamic line rating over the two-year period, and you can see this is about 300, uh, 130%. At some points in time, over 200% gain was available, effectively doubling the nominal capacity. However, if it would be unusual for a grid operator to actually load the power lines to twice the capacity, because the capacity of the sub substation equipment connected to the power lines may not be able to cope with such high loadings. That means the bottleneck may not be the power line capacity. What is useful, however, is that there is more capacity than the static rating almost all of the time, specifically here, 99.5% of the time. 
Also, 95% of the time, there's 6% above the static rating available. And 90% of the time, 14% above the static rating, is extra capacity available. The, extra quest uh, the question is, how does this help to reduce grid congestion? This line bill OST, as stated by the German regulator's report, is often congested and causes the deed to redispatch. The redispatch rule in Germany dictates that the most effective power plant to solve the congestion should be called the change output, which are typically the power plants clo in close proximity to the congested line. In this case, there are a few power plants connected at the north end of the line, which are often subjected to downward redispatch. The redispatch information can be seen on the German grid transparency platform called Netztransparenz on the web. For example, let's take 14th of February 2017. The Neugast power plant at the north of the Ost line was instructed to reduce its output by 200 megawatts from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. This totaled uh, to 1,750 uh, 1, megawatt hours of reduction in production in that day. What is the impact of this 200 megawatt power reduction on the line? This line is a 380 kV line, which means it can carry around 2,000 megawatts of power, considering the static rating. And without considering any losses between the power plant and the line, 200 megawatt reduction means there was a need to reduce the line loading by a maximum 10% of static line loading. Or in other words, 10% extra capacity of the line would have resolved the condition and there wouldn't have been a need to instruct the redispatch. We know from uh, the shown evaluated dynamic line rating performance that at least 14% gain is available for 90% of the time. To calculate the potentially avoided cost, we multiply the redispatch energy of 1,750 megawatt hours with the average redispatch cost of 23,000 euros per gigawatt hour, which is about 40,000 euros savings in one day. You can see for yourself from the data on the German grid transparency platform that this, is, this example is not an especially high congestion day, but a fairly typical day. So that's the two examples. I'm sorry to have to cut a lot of the material, but uh, we are almost 3 o'clock, so I'd like to go to the end and uh, show the customer testimonial. My name is uh, Philippe Carton. I'm the head of the National Control Center uh, for ALIA. And ALIA is the transmission system operator. in Belgium. Together with my team, I have to make sure that uh, the high voltage grid is uh, managed uh, in a secure way. And uh, what's also very important for, for ALIA, because it's part of our mission statement, is that we do everything in the interest of society. So that means that, uh, for example, making efficient use of our infrastructure, it's part of our mission uh, and one of our goals. There are two uh, big use cases uh, for ALIA using Ampassement. First one is in real time. Um, near the coast, we have a lot of wind farms connected, and without Ampassimon before, if there is congestion, the only uh, solution is to reduce or to curtail wind. Uh, in this case, once you install Ampassimon, um, there is uh, less uh, redispatching you have to perform. And it's very interesting to see that there is a, a correlation between Ampassimon and wind in feet. So the days when there is a lot of wind and higher congestion are also the days where there is, there is more ampacity uh, given thanks to Ampassimon. So this is the first very interesting use case which made our life easier uh, mainly at the coastal uh, area in Belgium. And the second use case is that thanks to Ampassimon, we can also provide more capacity to the, the day ahead capacity calculation market. Uh, so there we talk about order of magnitude, five to maximum 9% of additional ampacity we can provide to the market coupling, which is uh, very interesting for the market coupling because uh, it will generate social welfare, again, in the interest uh, of the society. So uh, that's the second very interesting use case uh, for Ampassimon. Uh, what I really like about uh, Ampassimon technology, uh, certainly if you compare it with other technologies, is that it actually measures the sag of the line, so it, it's very reliable because other technologies might uh, forecast or use algorithms, taking into account weather, solar radiation, things like that, but it's always an estimation, it's an algorithm. 
and Passimon really measures the, the, the sag of the line and it takes into account all parameters, even if you don't know it. Uh, so that's what I, what I really like about technology. It's, it's very reliable. You know it, there is a measurement uh, device and you know that you can trust on, on the measurement. Uh, that's very important for me. It's not just an algorithm. It's actually a physical device measuring the sag. Um, if you look at the benefits um, for society or, or other market parties, uh, it, it's clear that, for example, um, wind farms wanting to connect to the grid, they will get faster access to the grid if you make use of this kind of technology. I think it's a big benefit. Otherwise, they have to wait for investments, which takes very often five to ten years' time, so they can get quicker access to the grid. This is important. But also for other market players, um, um, if you look at uh, the added value it generates uh, for the market coupling, this is social welfare. This is in benefit of all, uh, all uh, consumers and producers, uh, they are able to sell or buy more energy under the international markets, of course under the condition that the Ampassimon uh, has forecasted additional capacity, but that's depending on, on the weather and things like that, so uh, that's also very clear interest for, uh, for society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you can um, take forward the presentation on Karina and Jean-Louis. Thank you. Thank you. I think Jean-Louis is going to continue the rest. Uh, I have mm. Yeah, it's a wrap-up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we, we like to make a following point uh, now. Um, dynamic line rating has become uh, relatively uh, common. It's uh, a mature uh, technology. Uh, it, it's been tried for more than uh, 20, 20, 25 years, and uh, our company has uh, started uh, research uh, over 15 years ago and uh, has started commercial deployments more than 10, 10 years ago. Um, so it's uh, in terms of technology, it's mature, and you you can see the proof of it. Uh, just if you look at the uh, tender round uh, announcement of uh, last year, huh, you can see one, two, three, four, six, six of them uh, in in various parts of the world, uh, Europe or uh, or the Americas, and uh, more are coming. We know about that. Uh, so it's DLR is. is becoming a uh, commonplace. Of course, it's uh, an innovation in certain cases, but uh, if uh, some of our listeners are uh, work for utilities, uh, my message is uh, be confident it works, it works well, uh, and there are a lot of uh, circuits uh, equipped. As for us, we have uh, 65 to 70 circuits uh, equipped, uh, and so a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, experience about that. Uh, so that was my point. It's uh, well well proven up to the control room uh, with the dispatch engineers, as you could uh, see. The applications are obviously uh, congestion management, uh, interconnectors, and uh, integration of uh, renewable power. As Rena pointed out, uh, we have a frame agreement with uh, RTE in France, um, and. Uh, most of the use cases will be, are and will be, for uh, integration of uh, wind power offshore or uh, onshore. Uh, the nice point about DLR is, uh, since we are in a smart grid forum, it's based on, on data and on measurements. Um, uh, so the, the, the value of the system that we uh, implement has nothing to do with the value of the assets that we uh, monitor. It's uh, the second uh, order or third order uh, amounts. So uh, the, the return on investment is uh, extremely uh, quick. We have uh, customers who do that kind of uh, study. We uh, they, they assess the internal uh, return rate, uh, IRR, and it's really uh, spectacular. Uh, so, of course, if you really have to, uh, to extend or uh, reinforce uh, your grid, uh, ultimately you will have to do it, but uh, that can be a little uh, postponed. And uh, we are talking about uh, optimization and uh, modernization when we are talking about uh, DLR. So it's, uh, it's good in all cases. Mm, 
Now, uh, after this uh, webinar, I suggest that you go to the, the links uh, here and uh, you have some uh, readings to do, uh, obviously, from uh, NSOE, from SIGRE, from us, uh, possibly. Uh, you can get some uh, training. We have uh, a partner in Paris uh, who is uh, providing uh, training on DLR. We also do a course in our uh, factory and head office. Uh, if you're interested in the uh, ELIA testimonial, you can go to the ELIA website and see how they explain their, uh, their method, their approach uh, to implement uh, DLR so that the first link uh, to the right and, and uh, below, you have uh, their way to uh, value uh, the, um, the, the forecast that they use and the measurements that they, that they use. Um, and yeah, finally, the... Uh, and Passimon DLR FAQ is, uh, can be a, a good read also. It will answer all the, the points that we uh, forgot today. And finally, all the references, the papers, scientific papers, the, uh, the standards, uh, the uh, CIGRE uh, papers that were published uh, over the years are uh, listed here.